Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak at the uh, famous Genot Roussel seminar. Uh, let's see. So, what I will talk about today is uh, joint work with Carsten Grover. Here is the chalk. <laughs> Sorry, I don't do uh, PowerPoint talks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I will talk about his joint work with Carson Gold. Is this still visible up here on the blackboard? Can I write this far up? Okay. Uh, so what I want to talk about is uh, what are called polar actions. So let me first define what they are and get some examples and some motivation for uh, uh, where they come from. So first the definition. Uh, so I have a Riemannian manifold, the metric G, and I have a group G acting by a legal G acting by isometries in the given metric. So in neither M nor G have to be compact, uh, but it should act by isometries. Uh, and I say that the action is polar, so the G action is polar if there exists a submanifold or an immersed submanifold. We call it sigma in M. It doesn't have to be embedded, but let me just assume for notational simplicity that it's embedded. Uh, such that, uh, so this is a complete submanifold. Such that uh, all orbits meet the submanifold sigma. And uh, uh, they meet them and they meet sigma orthogonally. So in other words, if I apply the group action to the submanifold to sigma, I get the whole manifold. So every orbit meets the submanifold. And if I take a point in, uh, in sigma, then the tangent space uh, of sigma is orthogonal to the orbit, to the tangent space of the orbit. So then uh, uh, this action is called polar. So some simple examples first. Maybe the uh, simplest example is just the metaphor of the two-sphere. And the group is simply the circle acting by rotations. So the orbits of the action are simply the small circles parallel to the great circle with north and south pole are fixed by the group action. And now the section is simply any great circle that goes to the north and south pole. So sigma is equal to a circle. And of course, it meets all these uh, small circles orthogonally. It meets everything, any one of these uh, twice. So these intersection points are not unique. It can meet in many points. Um, and when it does meet it, it meets it orthogonally. Okay. So uh, uh, maybe that's uh, my first example, a very general class of examples that fits into this category, which is in fact where my main interest came from originally, is a situation where you have a group action such that the dimension or the orbit space is simply one. It's one dimensional. So these are called homogeneity com one actions. So this number, the dimension, the quotient space is usually called the homogeneity of the action. So in this case, uh, this means that uh, your orbits are generically hypersurfaces. In this case, I can simply take a Jurassic that meets the uh, uh, generic uh, hypersurface orbits orthogonally, and this will be my section. So, 
So either a real line or a circle, depending on whether the Jurassic orthogon to the orbit closes up or not. So this is, a, again, a very special class, a very general class of manifolds, but the sections are, are one-dimensional. Um, the interest today will be in, in the case where this section has high dimensions, which makes the geometry quite more restrictive than this uh, general class of manifolds. So these manifolds I've studied a lot. I examine curvature properties on them. I produce new metrics of positive section curvature and non-negative curvature in exotic spheres. So this is a very nice class of uh, manifolds where one construct the manifold out of simple properties of the group action. And I was interested in how to generalize this to higher dimensions. And this uh, uh, class of group actions has a, has a long history. So uh, uh, the most classical example, example three, Here's a well-known uh, example of the adjoint action. So, so G is a compact Lie group, and G acts uh, on G via conjugation. And then the section sigma is simply a maximum torus. So every orbit meets a maximum meets a maximum torus, and you can easily check that it also meets it orthogonally when it does. This condition is very strong. It's a very strong condition that it has to meet it orthogonally whenever it meets it. I can also let G act on the Lie algebra by the adjoint representation, and then a maximum region subspace uh, inside the Lie algebra is my section. So, of course, this is a well-known, well-studied uh, situation, and uh, um, one of the motivations for generalizing this came from Pauline Turing, who were interested in generalizing the following kind of property of the adjoint action. So. Uh, There's something called the Chevalier's restriction theorem, which says that uh, if I look at C infinity functions on the Lie group, uh, invariant under the adjoint action of the group of some conjugation, uh, then this is uh, in one to one correspondence to C infinity functions of the maximal torus invariant under the Weyl group. This is true on the Lie group as well as on the Lie algebra. So one has this one-to-one -one correspondence, and the main point here is that it's a correspondence of C infinity functions. Right. Um, and Pauli and Turing were interested in uh, general, generalizing this property, and for this purpose invented this uh, concept of polar actions. Uh, also in the, started independently for other reasons by Sente. So there are two papers, one by Pauli Turing, one by Sente that studied these polar actions. And Pali Ting proved the following analog of, of this kind of uh, uh, Chiavelli property uh, for, for Lie groups. Uh, uh, but first, I have to define for you what's the analog of the Weyl group uh, in this general situation where I have my section, Gx on the manifold. So I define uh, what I want to call a polar group. It's the analog of a Weyl group, but it's not really a as special as Weyl groups are for compact Lie groups. So let me call that pi. I define it as the normalizer of sigma divided by the centralizer of sigma, where the normalizer of sigma is just uh, those group elements which preserve sigma, which take sigma to themselves, and the centralizer of sigma, then, those group elements which restrict to sigma their entity. Because this uh, here is a normal subgroup inside this uh, normalizer here, and the quotient is what I call the polar group. Turns out that this group here is also uh, equal to what's called the principal isotropy group. That's also precisely the group of, uh, uh, of group elements that uh, take a section to themselves and actively there. So the analysis definition, as one does for the value of a 
of a compact torus, right? normalize it by, by centralizer. And one can then show that this is a discrete group. This group is discrete. And acts properly discontinuously on the section sigma. Or it acts on sigma definition, and the action is properly discontinuous. Uh, and furthermore, uh, then uh, uh, the analog of what's true for a Lie group is that if I look at the quotient m divided by the manifold, uh, this is uh, isometric, if you want, uh, to the section divided by the polar group. So uh, these are topologically, and, but also metrically, uh, the same the isometric as metric spaces, if you want to. So each orbit in m meets the section. Uh, that's the definition, and this is that it meets it precisely in the orbits of the, of the polar group. Okay. Completely analogous to the situation of a compact D group. What Palais in turn proved is that the analog of this is also correct. So C infinity functions on the manifold M invariant under the action on G are the same thing as C infinity functions on, uh, on the section of sigma invariant under the polar group. So it's again a restriction theorem if you want to. Because there's an obvious map, an obvious bijection, if you want to, right? Just restrict each function to the section. Or if I have the function on the section, I can extend it to the manifold uniquely because the g orbits meet the section. Right? So there's a one obvious one to one correspondence, but that the fact that this is C infinity, that this is C infinity, the extension is C infinity is non trivial. Right? So that's what's called this value restriction or extension theorem. So this is the right category in which a result like this for compact legals holds also right, for these kind of pole actions. Um, so this was the, uh, uh, maybe the motivation of Parley Turing. And then they uh, examined these kind of actions in a, in a sequence of papers uh, in more detail. I mean, maybe before I go on, uh, state a theorem uh, which somehow is similar to this, which is more recent, which is important for us. Also, it's an extension property. And this is a result due to a, a student of mine, Ricardo Mendes, which showed the following. So if I start with a manifold M, uh, a group action G, and a section sigma, so I have a polar manifold. Uh, then uh, any metric on sigma, uh, which is invariant under the polar group, extends or can be extended to a metric on M uh, invariant under G which is polar. So in other words, if I start with the Riemannian metric, uh, so notice that this concept is really not just the concept of the group action, but you have to have a metric uh, associated to it also, because you have to have the concept of orthogonality. Um, so I have a metric on M, but now I can change the metric into something more convenient, uh, possibly more convenient, but change the metric on sigma of course, it has to be invariant under the polar group, clearly, uh, but once that's the only condition. I can then extend it to some metric on M, not unique, such that GX parsometries, and such that the section is the given section, and it fits the geometry. So, for example, uh, one case where this is particularly useful is that, say, if this section is uh, two-dimensional, we can assume the curvature of sigma is constant. So by the uniformization theorem, we can always assume that there is a, a material constant curvature on which this discrete group acts by isometries. And I, I can extend it to the manifold M, and uh, then the geometry on the section itself is particularly simple, just a constant curvature geometry. This turns out to be very useful. Uh, maybe one other remark that I should also make an easy consequence of the definition is that this implies the section sigma is totally Jurassic. So, for example, all the, yes, is two. Ah, I said it and didn't write it. 
the dimension of the, of the section is two, then I can assume it has constant curvature. Not all manifold, only the section. When I extend the metric, I don't know what the curvature properties of the extension are. But often one reduces, say, uh, certain geometric problems uh, just to properties along the section because uh, the, each orbit meets the section. So we can try to re reduce things to the section. Also, the beh behavior of the Jessic, many of the aspects of the behavior of the Jessic are described by the behavior of the Jessic on the section. If I can assume it has constant curvature, I get a very simple description of what the Jessics do along the section. And that has topological implications, for example, for the manifold. So, um, So, uh, um, let me maybe first now get back to another large class of examples, which was studied by Palais and, and Turing, and then by many others, uh, which is the following class, kind of generalizing the uh, case of the adjoint action of a Lie group. So here I start with a, a symmetric space. That's my manifold. And the metric on it is a, is a symmetric space metric. And then I've, uh, I can let H acts on G mod H by left translations. And this action is polar. It gives a last, uh, large class of uh, interesting examples of polar actions, of polar manifolds of polar actions, in which a geometry is, is very, very nice. Uh, it's a, just a symmetric space. And similarly, I can also say, look at the action, uh, uh, also the action, induced action on the tangent space at the point, at the foot point, is also a polar action. So the isotropy representation you want to of the symmetric space is also a polar action. Because in this case now a linear action, this is a linear action, a representation if you want to, which is polar. Uh, these representations are important, so uh, a representation is called an S representation. Uh, if it arises in this fashion. So linear representation with respect to the Euclidean metric is, uh, uh, which is polar with respect to the Euclidean metric is called an S representation. Because remember that these uh, sections are totally Jurassic. So for the representation, it just means you have a representation in a vector space and you have a linear subspace such that all the orbits of the representation meet that subspace orthogonally. It turns out to be a very special property because it has the following theorem by Dadok. That uh, if uh, uh, G is connected and acts uh, linearly and polarly on a vector space V, uh, then it is equivalent to an S representation. So in other words, there exists an isomorphism of this vector space V with a tangent space or some symmetric space, and the group that acts is the group H, and it acts by the adjoint representation on the vector space. This is almost true uh, up to what is called uh, orbit equivalence. And it can happen that uh, if, I, if my group, say, H here, so I call this group H in this situation here, if it acts on the vector space V, it can happen that you have a subgroup inside H which has the same orbits. And the two linear representations are called orbit equivalent. And of course, the uh, definition of polar action just depends on the geometry of the orbits. Right? So 
if this happens, if a subgroup has the same orbits, then the linear representation by H prime is also polar. Although the one by H is the one that I, that I would call the S representation. So up to this kind of uh, uh, small uh, uh, modification that can happen, uh, polar representations by connected ligos are simply uh, these kind of very special S representations. So it's a strong condition. So this shows in a very simple, a simple situation that this is in fact a, a very strong condition. Um, look, this uh, paper may even have appeared before the Parley turn paper. So I think Parley may also, Parley and Turing may, may have also been motivated by this result. I don't remember the sequence of events, the years. This then, then led to a, a long sequence of papers uh, in which they studied uh, uh, polar actions. So, on symmetric spaces. So, uh, I should probably mention a few names Palais and Turing, Torbergson. Uh, and Colros, some other names that I'm sure I'm forgetting, but Colros eventually classified these in a sequence of paces. If the symmetric space is compact. So one knows what they all look like. If they are polar with respect to the, the symmetric space metric on your, on your manifold. Right? Uh, many of them look like this, uh, action right here, but there are also other types of action of a similar type which are, which are polar. But they're classified. They have lots of beautiful geometric properties, but our interest in the subject was, uh, was, uh, was different in that we wanted to construct, uh, uh, not study, say, polar actions on known manifold, but construct new, mani new, mani new manifolds and new actions uh, in a certain way from the, from the group and its stabilizer groups. So let me see um, what I should first explain. Um, ah, maybe right here I should write down uh, one more easy consequence of being polar. So if the action of D on M is polar, this implies that what are called the slice representations. polar. Let me explain again what I mean by a slice representation. So I have my group G acting on the manifold M. And I have some orbit uh, and I can then define a look at a tube around the orbit, a tube in neighborhood. At the point P I have my, my disk which is orthogonal to the orbit at this point. That's called a slice. And the stabilizer group, so the group that fixes this point, This, of course, acts on this, uh, on this slice, so GP acts on D. I can either look at this as sitting inside the manifold or just as the action on the tangent space. So that I can think of this as a linear action on the vector space. Acts on D, uh, this is called the slice representation. Okay. So, uh, you know, in a way, if you look at group actions, the two uh, simplest invariants that one can first look at is the various uh, isotropic groups. Uh, and after you uh, give a list of the isotropic groups, you can also look at how they act on the normal space to the orbits, so at these slice representations. These are the two most basic invariants I can associate to, to a group action. And usually that is far from determining what group action looks like, but for polar action, in a certain sense, uh, uh, that's sufficient. And that's what I, what I want to explain. But uh, uh, this result right here shows that, uh, uh, in fact, polar actions are also, in this sense, very special in that uh, the slice representation that occurs in this picture here is one of these S representations up to orbit equivalence. So that makes these group actions very special that uh, um, 
these representations must, must be these kind of S representations. Even equivalent uh, uh, to another property of polar actions, which I can maybe state separately also. You remember M or G was the same thing as uh, the section divided by the, by the polar group. The polar group is a discrete group acting on this on the section sigma, and this means that this is an orbifold. So in other words, uh, if a group action acts polar, one condition that it has to satisfy is that the quotient must be an orbifold. It's, of course, in general, a very special property. And it turns out that this fact here, that the slice representation po is polar, is actually more or less equivalent to the fact that the quotient is an orbifold. So that's an obstruction for a group action to be polar with respect to some remaining metric. Okay. So I want to construct new examples, and maybe before I start that, let me just mention uh, two special cases that will come out in the end. So one example that we'll be able to see later on is that uh, every P2 action on a compact simply connected four manifold is polar. So such uh, T2 actions on four manifolds, they're, they're well studied. Uh, the manifolds are classified. Uh, so one knows a lot about these actions, uh, but here I'm saying that indeed on the manifold and the four manifold, one can also find a Riemannian metric such that uh, all the orbits meet that section orthogonally, so it's polar. Uh, another consequence uh, of uh, what, uh, what actions are polar is the following, that if I have a an n torus, uh, which acts on a symplectic manifold, uh, as, a uh, as, a, as a Hamiltonian action, so it preserves a symplectic form, and if you want to the somewhat stronger condition, the action fields must be a Hamiltonian vector fields. Just think of it as preserving the symplectic form if you want to. Then any such action is polar. So this is a Riemannian metric on this two n dimensional manifold with this property that the action is polar. It would be interesting to relate the geometry of the metric uh, that comes from this property here with the geometry of the symplectic form. And that, that, uh, I don't know how, if, how, how well one can relate them. Um, the question might be, can I uh, do this in such a way that the section sigma is, uh, is Lagrangian? The section sigma, of course, is something that depends on the choice of the metric. Right? So for this, I have to find a metric on the manifold. And that's, of course, a property of just a symplectic form. Uh, so whether one can do that, that's... Uh, an open question that might be interesting. Okay, so these are two examples of, special examples of what will come out in the end of things that are polar. Pardon? Uh, yes. Well, it does, since it's a property of the orbits, it doesn't matter, matter but uh, and, and, ah, okay, of course, here it matters, yes, yes. Acts effectively. Thank you. Um, okay. So, uh, so my goal is to construct the manifold.
from a group G from some abstract manifold sigma, which are, will be the candidate for a section, uh, and from the stabilizer groups. In the remaining sense. In the remaining sense. Right. So a priori this here, because uh, uh, this is not Riemannian geometry, right? I'm just describing a particular kind of action which happens to be symplectic with respect to some symplectic form. For the moment, forget this fact. Just look at this as an n-torus action on your two-n-dimensional manifold. Then I'm saying the manifold has a Riemannian metric on it, such that the, all the torus orbits meet this section and meet it orthogonally. The relationship with omega then, which was given a priori, uh, is uh, cl completely unclear in our construction. There's another Riemannian metric. It would be interesting to relate that Riemannian metric to the geometry of symplectic form also, and that I don't know. So a natural kind of relationship might be is that the section is Lagrangian. This would be, I think, interesting in the context of symplectic geometry. But a priori, they have nothing to do with each other, the, the, the polar and the symplectic. For example, it's not true that every n torus action on, two n, on a manifold dimension 2n is polar. That's not true in, this, uh, in dimension 4. It's true in high dimension not. But these special Hamiltonian actions, they're all polar. Okay. So I want to define a, a, from the stabilizer groups in what I want to, I want to form into what I call a group graph of the action. So I'll organize all the stabilizer groups that the action has into some kind of graph in a systematic fashion. And for this, uh, uh, let's make the following assumption. In fact, this is uh, motivated by a theorem of uh, uh, Alexandrina and, and Tobin. We show that uh, if, uh, if I have a polar action, and M is simply connected. This implies that the polar group pi is generated by protections. Just like the Weil group for, for a compact Lie group uh, generated by reflections. This is too, uh, far from true in general. So if I don't assume, assume that if it's simply connected, then these polar groups can be arbitrarily complicated. But uh, under this, uh, in this situation, it must be generated by reflections. So by reflection, I just mean uh, you have some hypersurface uh, in which R is a reflection. The hypersurface, uh, this of course here is then, uh, so let's call it lambda maybe. Must be totally Jessic. This is a reflection. Because there might be other hypersurfaces, which it also reflects, or there might be other lower dimensional things that are fixed, but here just requires the existence of one hypersurface in which R is a reflection. Okay. So such an element R, I want to call a reflection or a minor manifold. Here the statement is that the group is generated by reflections. And furthermore, and there are no what are called exceptional orbits. So, in other words, no orbits of the same dimension as a principal orbit. Uh, these are called exceptional orbits. They don't, they don't exist for polar actions on a simple connected manifold either. So, what I'm, I want to make that assumption from now on, just to simplify things. In fact, this makes it much simpler. So, once I have this. Uh, uh, group generated by reflections acting on my sigma. Uh, I can associate to that a chamber system in the, in the usual fashion. So that's, uh, if you look at the complement, uh, say, I call C the complement of the union 
of all reflecting hypersurfaces. That's of course that's now an open set, and the closure of that I call the chamber, or the action of phi on sigma. Um, so it's a fundamental domain of the action, if you want to, uh, and uh, at least uh, c times pi is all of uh, sigma. Right. Now in this. Uh, situation here where the manifold simply connected. In fact, this situation is even a little better. Namely, uh, it's also true, so if M is simply connected, then it's true that this representation is unique in the sense that if I have an element in the polar group such that you take C to C, this implies that gamma is trivial. In other words, it says that uh, uh, the manifold divided by G, which was the section divided by the polar group, is actually isometric to the, the chamber C. Because there are no more implications among the chamber coming from the wire group. So it's really a fundamental dis uh, domain in, in, this, in this strong sense. So I can just uh, visualize this quotient here really as, as a nice chamber. It has lots of structure because it comes as the uh, complement of the union of these totally jessic hypersurfaces. So it means it's stratified. So the boundary of C is stratified by totally jessic faces, say F, Fi, possibly infinitely many, uh, and their and the intersections also, of course. So the strata of the boundary are faces and various intersections of faces. And these are all totally jessic in my, in my chamber. And uh, now we also have associated to them in our situation the stabilizer groups. So each strata has associated to it the stabilizer group. So G sub P, where P is an element in the strata. It turns out that uh, if I go along the strata, the stabilizer groups are actually a constant. They don't change as I go along the strata. So each strata has one of these groups and one of these choices among the stabilizer groups. There's a unique choice, which is the stabilizer of this, of this strata. So maybe if I draw some simple pictures, uh, you can think of it as a triangle, for example, as your domain C, right? boundary stratified by geosics and by vertices. Uh, and I have uh, uh, there is groups associated to this picture now. That's where, what's going to be my group graph. So the interior points uh, associated to the principal ISW group. And then each side has an ISW group. Let me call it maybe L1, L2, and L3. And each vertex also has an ISW group, K2, K1 and K3. And then, of course, uh, uh, the group uh, uh, L1 must be contained in the group K3, where if something stabilizes these points, it also stabilizes the endpoints. There's an obvious inclusion among these groups. So I can draw a group graph associated to this kind of picture here. By the biggest group is the group G, and the next ones are the are the groups K1, K2, and K3, which are contained in the big group. And then each one of these groups, Ki contains uh, two of the side groups as subgroups. Okay, so K1 contains L2 and L3. K3 
K2 contains L1 and L3. And then K3 contains uh, L1 and L2. And then, of course, all of them contain the group H, which is a principal isotopic group. So this is where my group graph associated with the uh, triangle. And I call that the uh, uh, G of C. Of the chamber. So I'm, I'm choosing a chamber here. And uh, associated with the chamber, I have, I have this kind of a group graph. Um, and now I want to uh, uh, describe a converse of this this picture. So I'll put up my zero maybe. Uh, given a group G and uh, a uh, stratified manifold C, a candidate for the chamber. So it should have smooth interior and the boundary stratified by totally realistic uh, uh, faces. Uh, and an associated group graph called a G of C, maybe a better marking, but I have my front red chamber here and everything is marked. The interior is just a pencil one and all the faces have a marking, intersectional faces have a marking, uh, and there uh, are uh, inclusions among all these mark groups in a, in a natural geometric fashion. Right? Um, so it's a group graph uh, with what I want to call compatibility condition. which I'm going to explain in a minute. Uh, then there exists uh, a polar manifold. Let's call it an M of a group graph uh, on which G acts polar. Um, with the this chamber C and group graph associated to that in the fashion over there, the given group graph. And conversely, uh, M is determined up to equivalent diffeomorphisms by the group graph. Okay, so now I have to explain to you what, what's the condition on this group graph uh, that, makes this, uh, that makes this into a, a correct statement. Um, and that's the condition that I essentially mentioned before, namely uh, Compatibility here means the following. Uh, for each group K in the group graph, so associated to one of these uh, strata there, uh, the history of K is the group graph of an S representation. In the following sense, uh, so I think I just drew this picture, I erased it already. I forget in which order the chaos of the bigger ones. Okay, what? K1 contained L2 and L3. Anyway. So if I take a, a vertex out of this group graph, so this is an isotopic group right here. 
when everything was contained in H. Uh, then the history of that is simply everything that lies below it, which is connected to it by, by arrows. So this would be the history of this vertex right here. It forms a group graph in its own right, right, where this is now the group that acts, and these are the very stabilizer groups associated to that. And this group graph should be the group graph of what we call a, pol a linear polar representation, namely S representation. That this has to be satisfied is simply from the fact that uh, uh, this holds, this has to hold. It's in slice representations. Are polar. Right, so this group K in the group graph, it corresponds to a strata. Uh, this strata then corresponds to an orbit, and this group then acts on the slice orthogonal to the orbit. It has a certain slice representation, and it is again a polar representation. It has a group graph in its own right, and that graph should simply consist to everything that lies below the, the marking that I picked out in my chamber. So that's a compatibility condition. And once this is satisfied, that's all one needs, then one can construct a manifold. Uh, so that's the interesting part here, that one defines new manifolds out of this, with group, which interesting group actions associate to them. And that's a very powerful tool. Let me give you some examples. The situation that I've studied a lot before is uh, what I mentioned uh, already, uh, the situation where the, the section is one-dimensional. So if it's compact, it consists of an interval where the two endpoints are the marking. So then I have uh, one group uh, in the middle here, which is a pencil isotopy group. I have a group uh, K here, as for K minus and K plus here, corresponding to the stabilizer at the endpoints, and all of these sit inside the group uh, G, in fact, uh, both of these groups must contain uh, the group H. So that's my uh, group picture. The group graph is just uh, this simple kind of picture, which I've used a lot in the past. And now my compatibility condition is simply that these quotients uh, must be spheres. So in this very special situation, one can see that that's all that what this compatibility means. And uh, uh, this is very easy to construct. Right? A group G with various subgroups with this kind of weak compatibility condition that these quotients are spheres. And one knows how to write spheres as homogeneous spaces. So there are many different kind of pictures one can draw the situation. One defines new manifolds that way. These manifolds can be exotic spheres. Uh, they can have all kinds of interesting topology and geometry. And a couple of years ago, in fact, I constructed in this kind of category here, new manifolds of positive section curvature as certain Kohn-Jumann manifolds whose topology at the time we didn't know, and then it turned out it was homeomorphic but not diffeomorphic to the unitangible bundle of the force sphere, which is something we didn't know. So that's part of the story, is that you might be able to describe something just by groups, subgroups, certain compatibility condition, it defines a manifold. A priori, you don't know what the manifold looks like. It's just there's a concrete construction by a certain gluing procedure. Uh, this is obtained by a gluing procedure. But a priori, you don't know what the manifold is that you obtain in that fashion. It might be known or it might be something new and interesting. So that's an old category. Some other simple examples. Uh, here's one example. Let's assume the group is uh, SO3. And each vertex... Uh, I associate to the SO3. That means for the group action, these must be fixed points on the manifold and that it's going to define. Right? And then here are for the side groups, I look at a subgroup O2 inside SO3, which is embedded in a block. Right? And there are three different blotting, block embeddings. And for each side, I choose one of these different block embeddings, uh, or the, the two by two rotations and one of the three blocks. And then uh, the, the principal one is just the, or the diagonal matrices, Z2 squared inside SO3. 
that turns out to satisfy this kind of compatibility condition. So it defines a manifold whose dimension is, well, the principal orbit is SO3 divided by Z2 squared, so that's three-dimensional. It meets a section orthogonal, which is two-dimensional, so it's a five-dimensional manifold. This turns out to be uh, a known example, a symmetric space, SO3 SU3 mod SO3, on which SO3 acts poorly. That's an example you've seen already. That turns out to have this kind of group graph right here. What turns out to be a little bit more subtle is that uh, the fact that I'm using three different embeddings here is crucial. I'm not allowed to choose the same O2 on the sides here. This would not be satisfies this kind of compatibility condition. It's a little more subtle, but so one has to be uh, careful how to construct these group graphs. But I can uh, now draw many other group graphs. A uh, uh, similar example would be uh, I let my group be SO4. So two vertices are fixed points, and these two points I have fixed points here. And here I just uh, look at SO3 sitting inside SO3. That's my marking here. And then the marking on the other two sides is the same as before. So all sitting inside SO3 as a, as a block embedding. And then here it's, uh, again, Z2 squared. That's also a valid uh, marking of my chamber, which is just a triangle here. And now the orbits are SO4 divided by Z2 squared. That's six dimensional. Plus two is eight dimensional. It's an eight dimensional manifold. Right. And that's not a symmetric space. It turns out that uh, the section sigma has genus 2. It's the surface of genus 2, and that cannot happen for a polar action on a symmetric space. So it's not a symmetric space. Of course, one I can now can generalize this. I can look at a polygon with many sides, right, and associate these kind of groups here at the vertices and at the sides in various configurations. And I get many other eight dimensional manifolds in the same fashion for a more complicated uh, uh, chamber. Uh, with different kind of markings. Um, so now the situation is. Uh, which is the situation the following. I take as my fundamental, as my chamber, uh, a square. And the group G is a two torus. And all the verdicts are fixed points. Principal isotope group has to be trivial for a torus action. And now for the sides, I can uh, actually choose circle actions as uh, stabilizers. So each one of these sides here has a circle action as a, as a circle as a stabilizer which, of course, as a subgroup inside T2, can have a certain slope. And these circles can have different slopes, and which will then uh, change the group action. Turns out that one can arrange it in such a fashion. So this slope is, say, 1, 0. This slope is 0, 1. Uh, this slope is 1, 0. And this slope is uh, is 1, comma k k comma 1, where k is some integer. Turns up to automorphism of the two torus, one can arrange the slopes in such a fashion that they look like this. Uh, that's a valid marking according to this kind of theorem. So this uh, chamber system, this square with this kind of marking, defines a manifold of dimension 4. Two-dimensional section, two-dimensional principal orbits has dimension 4. And this manifold, this four-manifold, is diffeomorphic to uh, S2 cross S2 when K is even, and CP2 connected some with CP2 bar when K is odd. But in each case, the action is a different action because it's a different uh, marking of the, of the diagram. And the marking of the diagram determines the action up to equivalent diffeomorphisms. These are infinitely many actions which are polar on, on these kind of four manifolds. And this uh, result I mentioned earlier that every T2 action of four manifold is polar is uh, due to the fact that they can also describe by this kind of uh, uh, picture of a domain in the plane whose sides are polygons, the vertices are fixed points, uh, and, uh, and the side groups are certain circles. Uh, they can all be described in this fashion. And one has to satisfy, one has to verify this compatibility condition uh, 
which has to be satisfied at the vertices here. Yeah, I don't want to go into that, sir, but this is, in the case of torus action, this is always satisfied. In the same fashion, these kind of uh, uh, Hamiltonian torus actions of Tn on M2n, they're polar by the same kind of construction that they have a, a very similar kind of picture. Right? You have a moment map, the image of a moment map is a polyhedron, the vertices of the polyhedron are fixed, fixed points of the action. It's a very similar kind of uh, picture, and it's polar by the same, by the same construction. Um, let me finish by mentioning one more result, which I think I mentioned in my abstract. Uh, I can try to relate the topology, so, or the geometry, or the sigma, the topology of the manifold. Okay. And here's one result in this section, in this direction. Uh, if, uh, so mg is, is polar, and if uh, sigma has constant curvature, equal to 0 or 1, uh, then M is what's called rational elliptic. So in rational homotopy theory, this is uh, manifolds fall into two categories, ones which are called rational elliptic, ones are rational hyperbolic, the generic ones are hyperbolic, uh, and uh, these kind of polar manifolds where the section has just constant curvature 0 or 1, these are, these are rational elliptic. Because remember that if the section is two-dimensional, I can assume it is constant curvature, and then this is a very special case where the uh, manifold must be rational elliptic. Generically, your section is going to be a surface of higher genus, and uh, then you'd expect the manifold to be rationally hyperbolic, although we don't know that yet. So the question is, uh, if the curvature is constant equal to minus 1, does this imply that M is rationally hyperbolic? In the sense of rational homotopy theory, and that we don't know. Maybe another question, uh, so that, that I'm also interested in, kind of a question about the very beginning of the definition. The question is, uh, uh, is a section sigma, um, one to one, sigma one to one immersed. So my picture in the beginning, I just had the picture of thinking of sigma as being embedded. But it's easy to find examples where sigma is not embedded, but at least the, uh, uh, it's always a, an, an immersion that's injective. So it's a one to one immersion. Is that necessarily the case? So if I have this kind of submanifold, immersed submanifold, meeting all the orbits orthogonally, can it occur that this has self intersections? My guess is uh, that this cannot happen if the manifold is simply connected, but I don't know how to, how to prove that, at least not yet. Um, okay, so maybe I should stop here. Thank you. <laughs>